So now we're going to look at another key model in health promotion, something called the precede proceed model. This model was invented by someone named Lawrence Green, who's kind of a big name in health promotion. And what this model really does is it, it's got more specifics. Instead of being like, okay, these are the levels you can um, have an intervention at or looking at like the who and the what and the how of an intervention, this actually talks about the steps. Okay, what do I need to do first? If I'm going to make a really good intervention, if I'm going to really promote health that really makes a difference, what's kind of my decision-making algorithm that's going to help me figure out what are the stages that I need to do to actually make a difference, okay? So as it says here, it's like a process for doing health and community work. And the pre c pro -C model really focuses on the community. They're kind of like, they're key. Like if we're trying to make a difference in a community, we actually have to go into that community and understand that community and consult with that community in order to make an intervention that's actually going to serve their needs, not just what we think their needs are. We really need to identify this community and understand it before we can make a difference. Okay, so the precede proceed model, it really is like precede, like before you get started, let's precede. Our intervention with this precede process <laughs> and then once we've kind of developed we've kind of done kind of an inventory of our community and what the issue is and what are the kind of barriers and what are the kind of things that are going to help this intervention and we've made an intervention that's precede okay then we proceed then we run the intervention and we evaluate it. The proceed step is really about like, okay, I'm running this thing. Am I actually running it the way that I intended to run it? Is, are the people changing what I thought they would change? And is that making a difference in the area that I wanted to make a difference on? Okay, so that's the proceed side of things. And quite honestly, like policy, regulatory, and organizational constructs and educational environmental development, quite a mouthful. I feel like he just tried to find the words to fit in to the word proceed. So don't get too caught up in the names of this model, but it's really important that you understand the steps in it. Okay, it's like, it's kind of you reverse engineer in the first step, you reverse engineer your, your strategy, okay, and then you implement it and evaluate it. Precede, proceed. Okay, that's how it works. Okay, so this is a framework. It's sometimes expressed with steps, two, phases two and three kind of as one. But like I said, the first step, which has different phases, is the precede step. And this whole um, part of the model, the precede part of the model, is really about, like I said, assessing your group, assessing the main issue, trying to figure out what's actually going to make a difference, figuring out what are the administrative and political barriers or, or opportunities that we can work with and then this is the proceed side of things okay once we have implemented it okay we start to evaluate it to make sure that we're actually doing what we set out to do okay so that's just kind of an overview now i'm going to go through each one of these stages and give you an example of what i mean so phase one is social assessment and is situational analysis so this stage is really focused on quality of life like we said earlier, this whole precede proceed uh, model is really a participatory process. So we want to involve the communities and people that we're trying to target. And that's really important, especially in this first phase where we talk with our population and figure out what kind of quality of life issues are they really facing. Is it, are they facing uh, like educational, uh, low education levels, low income levels, low opportunities for physical activity, low opportunities to practice their cultural practices. Okay, so we consult with them with kind of their big, big ticket items of like what is kind of hindering their quality of life, okay? And then in that second stage, we kind of go a little bit of further and like, let's say that it was uh, a cultural factor, they wanted to improve their cultural connectivity and whatever else, we might look at what's actually affecting that. What are the factors that are having a negative impact on them being able to, let's say, practice their culture, okay? And maybe it is a health concern. 
maybe because um, their community um, has a lot of physical inactivity, they can't even meet up to, to practice the cultural things that they want to practice, okay? And how do we know for sure there's a physical inactivity issue? Maybe we need to survey people. Maybe we need to do um, some epidemiological research. Maybe we need to do structured interviews, focus groups. Maybe we need to look at all the determinants that are affecting that ultimate outcome, okay? So this is really just like an overall assessment of kind of the epidemiology of that community. And sometimes if that's kind of pieced together with this third phase, which is kind of the behavioral and lifestyle assessment too, okay? So what kind of things, for instance, are, are blocking their ability to be active? Why are they not being active? What kind of behaviors are standing in their way or other factors are standing in their way, okay? So being aware of the environmental factors that, that influence these behaviors and what kind of things need to be changed in order so, for instance, this community is more, more, more physically active, okay? So in the next stage, here we look at, this is kind of, I would argue this is one of the, the bigger stages because we need to look at the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors that affect, for instance, people's ability to be active, or that affect their likelihood to smoke, or that affect uh, how much they eat, okay? So what do I mean by predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors? Let's look at this a little bit further, okay? So a predisposing factor is something that happens before a behavior takes place. And sometimes these things are demographic or like genetic or biological. So if some people aren't physically active, it might be because they never learned to be active, or it might be because they have a physical limitation. Maybe they, they, they have a disability that impacts their ability to be active, or maybe they just don't have the knowledge or the right attitudes or the right beliefs about physical activity. Okay, so again, this is a predisposing factor because it happens before that behavior even takes place, okay? And is this a place we intervene? That's the question. Is this an area where we can make a difference or are there certain enabling factors that we can focus on that are going to, that are kind of during the behavior that kind of help it be easier, okay? So for instance, here's an example. If we want people to pick up their, their dog poo <laughs> from the streets by providing doggy bags, that enables them to actually be able to do it. Okay, a predisposing factor would be like, do they even know that they're supposed to do it? Do they have good attitudes about it and beliefs about it? An enabling thing would be providing the, the bags. Okay, with physical activity, an enabling factor could be like having good, good parks, having good, um, having cheap access to gyms, right? These things, uh, or making more gyms in, an, in a particular area. These things enable people to actually participate in that behavior, okay, to make it possible. Okay? And there's lots of areas where we can intervene to enable a certain behavior to take place. Policies, laws, um, investment in certain things, uh, social support and skills. These are all things that enable a behavior to change. Okay? And then reinforcing factor. Reinforcing factor, it's like a, it's like a good job factor. <laughs> it's like a, you, you are doing the you adopted the behavior and you're doing it, how do I just make you feel good about it? How do I make you keep doing it? Or influence you so you feel like, hey, this, like, ah, I did it. I'm like doing a good job, right? That's a reinforcing factor. So some sort of feedback, positive reinforcement, or even negative reinforcement sometimes works too. But like, so the example I have here, a reinforcing factor is like, you will be fined. If you're trying to quit smoking, something that's going to like reinforce you not smoking is that if you do smoke, you're going to get a fine for smoking. Something that reinforces wearing a mask in Colombia is if you don't wear a mask, you're going to get a fine. Conversely, it could be like praise. Like if you do quit smoking, maybe the people around you, they're going to be like, yeah, there's a community excitement about it. A really good example here is uh, Alcoholics Anonymous which has a lot of reinforcing factors in place, right? So when you go uh, like a month without drinking or two months without drinking, you get a chip. 
right? It's a chip that tells you that you've, you've been sober for that long and that reinforces the behavior and this, these are things that help people change, okay? So like I said, in this fourth stage, we look at these predisposing, reinforcing and enabling factors and see, can we hit all three of them in our intervention? Our, and again, we'll work with our community to figure these out. Like, are these areas, where, what are these areas, and where can we actually make a difference in a way that our community wants us to make a difference? Okay, because remember, you gotta work with your community on this, okay? And then phase five is like, is what we want to do actually possible? What are the administrative barriers? What are the political barriers in place? Right? So if we're trying to get clean drinking water to a, to a place, is there political capital to do that? Right? If we are trying to build more parks so people find it easy to exercise, do we have the space for it? Do we have uh, an eager politician that's trying to score points by investing in something like this? Right? Is, there, is, that, is that even geographically possible to create that park? Okay, so we want to make sure that what we want to do is aligned with kind of what's possible given the system that, that these individuals are existing within. Okay, and sometimes we can find, and the cool thing is sometimes you can find policies that are like, hey, that's going to help me, right? If I use this policy or this funding body or this other thing, it's actually going to help me do my intervention. Okay, so all of that is the precede. Okay, so before my intervention, let's talk to my community, figure out what their problems are, figure out why they have those problems, figure out how we can, what are the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling things that are affecting those things, and figure out what are kind of the system-based factors that are going to help or hinder our ability to deliver a particular intervention. Okay? So that's precede. So now that we have preceded and we've thought of an intervention, we've consulted with our community, we kind of have an idea of what we want to do, and we're going to do it this way because it actually helps this community in this particular way, in a way that they want to be helped. Now that we've figured out our intervention, now let's run it. Now let's run it and evaluate it. That's proceed. Okay. So phase six is actually running the thing. Okay, I've decided to intervene in this group of people. They want me to do this. They have this problem. I figured out, or we figured out together that they have this problem because of this other thing. And these are the things, these are the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors that are going to help change that thing. And given the political system that they're in and the administrative system they're in, these are the changes that are actually possible to make. Okay, now let's start running it. Okay, this is what I decided on. Let's start running it. That's phase six. Okay. And then phase seven, eight, and nine, these are all about evaluation. Am I actually doing what I set out to do? And am I accomplishing the goals that I set out to accomplish? That's what these last phases of the proceed model are, okay? In order to do that, we need to kind of monitor what we are doing and make sure, like I said, that we're actually doing what we said we're gonna do. So this becomes a bit of a challenge on smaller scale projects where we might not have the funds to like run a, a randomized control trial or do like formal structured interviews and focus groups, okay? Or even run surveys sometimes, although surveys are kind of easier these days with things like SurveyMonkey, okay? But at a smaller scale, we might just keep track of everything we did and make sure that we're actually doing what we said we were gonna do, okay? And again, we might wanna survey in stage, let's say seven, we might want to survey the people that are part of the intervention that like help to develop the intervention to be like, hey, are we actually doing what we said we were going to do? We said we were going to do X, Y, and Z for this community. Are we delivering the program the way we said we were going to deliver it? Okay. It's not about outcomes. It's about the process. Am I doing what I said I was going to do? Okay. And then stage eight or phase eight, now we're going to measure more specifically, are we having an impact on behavior, lifestyle, and environment like we wanted to? Okay, has the environment changed? Has behavior changed? And again, surveys, uh, randomized control trials, ideally, these kind of things can help us in this process. And then in phase nine is like, did I actually change that bigger level thing I set out to change? 
right? Is there more cultural inclusion, for instance? Is there a more harmonious society, whatever that means, right? Is this bigger area of quality of life really improved because of what we said? And again, we can monitor through those practices I talked about to actually help us figure that out, okay? So again, this is the precede proceed model. Make sure you, like, it's like the, the analogy they use is building a house. You don't want to just build the house by picking up a bunch of things and throwing them around. You need a process. You need to figure things out. What do I have to do first? What do they want? What do they not want? You know, where am I going to put this? Where am I going to put that? How is this going to work better? That's the precede. Okay, and the proceed is like building the house and making sure I'm actually building it right. <laughs> making sure all my, like, all my tools are working that I'm using the tools that I said I was going to use and that it's actually being built the way that I want it to be built and that the owner is happy. Okay. So that's more the proceed side of things. So in summary, pre-seed proceed is about a framework for figuring out how to deliver a good intervention that takes into account the needs of a population and that works with that population to develop an intervention that actually addresses their needs, their lifestyles, their limitations, their advantages. It's just a better way of thinking out an intervention and not just trying to do things willy-nilly. That's the pre-seed-proceed model.